get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Einstein Bagels, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. Uh, Last year, we hosted uh, events in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, and Las Vegas, and maybe coming to a city near you. So if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com and contact us to find out when and where our next event will be. Uh, I am very excited to introduce today's guest. We have Michael Eldridge, who's founder of Safety Glasses USA.com. His experience as a U.S. Marine veteran, thank you for your service, Michael. Auto mechanic and assembly line technician amplified the importance of vision safety. And in 2000, he turned his knowledge into one of the web's most popular companies for protective eyewear. They've grown to 20 plus employees and have supplied protective eyewear and safety equipment to hundreds of thousands of satisfied customers around the world. Michael, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Do you go by Mike or Michael? Either one is fine. Okay. Mike is, is fine. What is your wife? My call friends me? call me Mike. Friend? Yeah. Okay. Friends. We'll go with friends. Uh, so, Mike, I wanted to start off, um, you know, back in 2000, right? This mm-hmm. is, that was like the beginning days of the internet. And walk me through when you first started selling online. What did, what did that look like? Whew, you, were, was, you were a machine uh, operator at the time. Were you doing the machine operating and then that's you correct. Start, yes, okay. I was an assembly line technician. Correct. Yep. yep. Um, assembling uh, prop shafts for different types of GM vehicles and whatnot. Um, basically, the whole thing started from our dissatis- dissatisfaction with the eyewear that we had to wear in the factory. Mm. You know, a lot of it was big and bulky. It was uncomfortable. And the only way you could really order it was through a giant safety catalog, which meant you had to go talk to different departments and get together these big group orders. And it just... Because they wouldn't sell like one at a time. You had to kind of buy in bulk. Correct. You had to buy in bulk. And uh, so you had to get everyone to agree what what, uh, safety eyeglass they liked. And that would be hard to do. Yeah. 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 And back then, the selection was very limited. There really wasn't a lot of you know, cool styles out there, so to speak. But um, <clears throat> so we started doing some research and I had a partner at the time. I actually started the business with a partner and um, I'm not going to mention any names because um, he might keep him private. Sure. But um, we started doing some research into seeing what vendor or what manufacturer would actually work with us for, for starters. And we found three. And he had some experience on selling wholesale products in the past before he started working at uh, the factory. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he took on the, I guess the phone sales portion of it. And me being the nerd of the group, (laughs) I took on the website sales portion of it. I had no experience in building any websites at the time. I had a little bit of basic HTML knowledge. What are the options really at the time? Really wasn't anything. Um, I mean, if I'm not, if I'm correct, I mean, this is before WordPress. Um, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, so did some research, and you know, Yahoo was the was the main search engine back then. Um, yeah. We we kind of stumbled on and started to, and decided to go with Yahoo stores. That was where we started with the e-commerce platform. Uh, as you can imagine, the templates back then were extremely basic. Uh, the functionality was, you know, at the time we thought it was cool, but nowhere near what you get today. How did you accept payment at the time? Did it link up with like a shopping cart or something? Or? They had they had a built-in solution through, I think it was called Payment Tech mm-hmm. at the time. And that was one of the things that was so appealing was it had a built-in payment solution where Payment Tech was the gateway and the merchant provider all in one. Mm. 
So that was kind of the selling point at the time. And so uh, I built this website. We had a handful of products. I want to say we started with like 25 products. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I was kind of addicted to all these, at the time, uh, 3D uh, animations were like really popular, these little cartoonish creations. So this website had all these terrible animations all over it. Oh, you put and, them in uh, there. Yeah, I put them in there, trying to, you know, use them as like a gimmick, whatnot. And literally two or three days after we built the site, we started getting a few orders. And they would come in, onesies or twosies. And we actually had a live chat hmm. application wow. plugged into the site. And That's I pretty think sophisticated that, for that time. It was back then. It was it was something called live chat, I believe. And Anytime somebody would come on the site, it would ding dong, get a little ding dong uh, <laughs> indicator or alert. And I would go work second shift, and my wife would have the computer on at night. And then she would call me at lunchtime and say, Hey, you know, we had so many visitors, or, you know, a, a couple orders came in. And it becomes addicting. You just want to it sit was there very and addicting. listen to it, that. Yes. And it was so funny because she would call me and say, Do you know we just had eight orders? You know, and, uh, you know, we were very excited about it. And so this carried on over the course of a few months. And after about, I would say about three months of trying to improve the site and, and uh, you know, we took our own pictures. And that was taking a DSLR camera, putting the pictures on, the, on a table and, and, you know, then editing them ourselves and learning that whole process. Uh and they were terrible pictures because they weren't like the nice white backgrounds that you get now. Right. Stuff. You know, they were like on a concrete floor or a kitchen table type thing. Um, we started getting quite a bit of orders coming through. And then we were also taking duffel bags of these glasses to work. You were. And selling them at work. Oh, selling them at work. Yeah. And it was getting to the point where, you know, the factory we worked in at the time had about 700, maybe 800 employees and you'd have to swipe your card to get in the door. It was getting to the point where we couldn't even get through the door before we could swipe our card because people were attacking us trying to get wow. new safety glasses. It was just so such was a kinda, need. Because were yeah. you, how did you choose the 25 glasses? Obviously, you have a d experience with it because there's things you don't like. But how did you find 25 different uh, safety glasses that you liked? I mean, you could have gone with five. You could have gone with 50. Right. We thought 25 was just a good number, mm -hmm. and the way at the time, uh, our Yahoo store, you could you could display five products in a row, so that was kind of the, so we had five rows of five, basically, mm -hmm. was looked nice to us, um, and we chose the eyewear based upon the cool factor more than anything else. Right. We were looking like, hey, yeah, guys would like to wear that, that's pretty cool, Um and then we'd also look at some other styles. It was like, yeah, I think the ladies would like to wear that. That's pretty cool. And that's pretty much what we based everything on was cool factor. Um, and it paid off. So they would rush you at the door. How often do you need new safety glasses? Like once you sell to all of them, do they need them again for a while? Or It depends. A lot of it depends on the environment that you work in. You know, some environments uh, – are real easy on your eyewear and then there's other eyewear that you know maybe they have a lot of dust or debris or liquid spray or whatever and so your eyewear can deteriorate pretty yeah. quick so you have to you have to have some backup backups right yeah yeah sometimes it'll last a couple weeks in certain environments you might get a couple days out of them it just depends mm. and so with the with the eyewear itself what was the best selling then what's the best Back selling then, now uh, yeah, back then the style or the brand was Cruise, hmm. and I believe, I believe it's called the Ice I C E. Hmm. They had the Ice 1.0, and then eventually they came out with the Ice 2.0. Why was it popular? And it had a translucent frosted clear frame. Hmm. So um, just for look, the look of it. It wasn't a for functional the look. thing. It, it, it was, it was more a, of a clear look. frame, and it was a, a, a nice wraparound style. So it looked more like a pair of sunglasses, but clear frame and a clear lens, and people just loved them compared to the old boxy, gigantic things that people would wear. Mm -hmm. And then what about now? What's What are some Probably of Probably now are like your uh, company called Pyramex. 
they sell a ton of really nice uh, ergonomically designed styles. Um, their Pyramex Z-Tech is extremely popular, uh, Intruders. Plus, they branched off and make some sports eyewear now called Venture Gear that's geared more towards yeah. the outdoors market. Yeah, I mean, Mike, you probably have the fing, you know, your finger on the pulse of these things, right? The Pyramex. Probably you were using it before it went mainstream, I would Correct. assume. How do you stay on top of the trends and what's going on? We are in a unique position because we also sell uh, fashion eyewear, sunglasses. I should say sports eyewear. So we also carry like Oakley, Oakley SI, those type of things. So we see some of the trends that happen in the in the sports and the fashion market, which eventually trickles down into the safety market as well. Mm. Um, so we can kind of, I don't want to say we can predict, but we can kind of get a good feeling about what styles are going to become popular. Yeah. I want to talk about, and when we were talking before we started, about the evolution of e-commerce, right? Sure. And the beginning, you know, 2000, um, and you know, decades later, um, that things have evolved, software's evolved, websites have evolved, shopping carts evolved, and the products have evolved. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about the evolution on each of those, but I wanna start with the products, okay? So you started off with these 25 versions of protective eyewear. And you know, when you anyone looks at your site, you can get safety glasses, safety goggles, safety gear, sports eyewear, sunglasses, prescription eyewear, and then more stuff than that. And there's things like bifocals and shoot for shooting and women's and so it started off as safety. Ben, tell me what was the next evolution? Where did you branch out? It may have been just more safety eyewear, but yeah, for a while, for a few years it was just increasing the number of safety eyewear products that we had, bringing on new brands. Um, and then after we kind of felt like we had our bases covered on the safety eyewear side, then we started looking at expanding into some sports eyewear. Yeah. Um, and then eventually we were able to market ourselves and, and acquire some of the high-end brands like your Oakleys, your Wiley X's, mm -hmm. those type of things. And then we felt like, okay, people are coming here to buy safety eyewear. We should probably offer some other safety products as well. As well. So we got into hearing protection, some reflective clothing, hard hats, that type of thing. So hmm. uh, what we try to do is offer a one-stop shop for all protective eyewear, or what we call it PPE, personal protective equipment. Yeah. So when you decided to branch into sports eyewear from protective mm -hmm. eyewear, um, was that, how did you come to that decision? Was it customers were demanding things? Were you just seeing, you know what, I think that this is a direct offshoot of what we're doing anyways. How did you decide? Because here's the thing, and I'm not sure you can talk a little about this. I don't know if you have to carry inventory, but I mean, it's a big decision to, to branch off even to one more product. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Um, I think part of it was it, there were some customer demands or customer requests. It's like, you know, you guys should carry this. Um, and then the other part of it, too, was kind of diversifying. Um, we didn't want to have all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. And we decided that, you know, if we're going to go into the sports market, let's carry the top brands. Let's not dilute the whole site with everything. Mm -hmm. Let's pick on the stuff that we would wear personally. And mm -hmm. so we identified those brands that we were interested in, that we would personally wear, and that's what we decided to carry. Mm -hmm. And oh, sorry, no, go ahead. So the second part of that too was it was somewhat business based because on the higher end eyewear, there's greater margin, and so the profitability was increased by offering those products as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, I was talking to someone last week about they, for some reason, can't wear contacts and they play basketball. And so they, they go, I either wear my glasses or I just miss every shot because they, <laughs> they don't wear I can them. do that whether I'm and, wearing glasses or not. Right, exactly. And I said, why don't you get something out there that, you know, that is a prescription or, or whatever the case is. So I'll have to point them to your site. Do can they can someone use that like order from you? How does it work if they want to do um, obviously prescription glasses with like uh, the sports eyewear for basketball? 
Sure. Uh, the prescription side of it, we actually have just got involved with. That's kind of a new offering mm-hmm. for 2018. Uh, we actually teamed up with uh, SportRx. Mm. Uh, um, we've teamed up with them, and they handle all of our prescription side. Um, so by going to our website and clicking on the prescription eyewear link, you can select basically from subcategories. Are you looking for sports eyewear? Are you mm-hmm. looking for motorcycle eyewear, et cetera, et cetera? And from there, they can go on there, enter their prescription, and order any style that they want. And they there's literally like 1,700 different styles yeah. there that they can wow. go choose. So the latest from the evolution of the product standpoint, more from safety glasses and the sports eyewear kind of branched more into kind of sunglasses and now mm-hmm. prescription. What is the most popular category now? Is it still safety glasses? Yeah, safety yeah. is still our forte, and it probably will be for quite a while. Although we are seeing an increased interest in shooting eyewear and that type of thing. And mm-hmm. we're seeing an increase, I guess the best way I can describe it is multifunction eyewear, mm-hmm. where the safety eyewear has become so fashionable now that a lot of people, they wear them to work mm-hmm. and they wear them home. They're, you know, they're, they're good enough looking that That's they can nice. wear them as fashion eyewear. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the big bulky. I, I want to see a Correct. before and after picture on your site somewhere. Like, this is what it used to be like, and this is what it's like now. Yeah, a good example would be the uh, Cruise Stratus is, mm-hmm. an, is a very early example of what we used to have to wear. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, we still sell a lot of them really? uh, because they're inexpensive. Oh. So talk about, you know, from still on the evolution of the product side, mm-hmm. um, I want to talk about your own brand piece. Sure. What are your thoughts? You know, we talked a little about, you know, the private label or your own brand. Um, what have you done in that or what will you do in that arena? Because I feel it's a natural thing. I mean, you guys have mm-hmm. safetyglassesusa.com. So mm-hmm. you are, you know, just from the domain, the authority in the space besides being doing it for almost a couple yeah. decades. Yeah, right. And that's something that we're trying to do is, is, is uh, stay the authority in that, in that realm. Um, we started thinking seriously about private labeling probably in the third quarter of 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, and why, be- why then? And, uh, never or not three years ago. Partially because we didn't realize how important it is. I think some of it was just being naive on our, yeah. on our behalf. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, think- I feel like I see the mentality a little bit. Tell me if I'm wrong. People are already looking for certain brands. Is Correct. that the and so you're like, why make it more difficult? Is that was that the the reasoning, or is there something beyond that? It was part of it. I think part of it was we just never really thought about it very much, um, and there was never this pressure from the outside that says you need to go get your your own private label, your private brand. Mm-hmm. That all kind of changed in 2017, and probably earlier for many other businesses with the popularity of your other sales channels with especially Amazon being the 800 pound gorilla. Right. Um, you know, I'm guilty of, I use Amazon probably as much as anybody else and we do sell on Amazon. You do. But sometimes it can, it feels like it's a race to the bottom. Mm, Cause there's and, other people selling the same exact thing. And so, right. How do you, how do people differentiate outside exactly. of price? Is there a way especially, to differentiate? Especially with safety eyewear because it's more of a commodity than, say, other types of products. And so it, it gets a little frustrating trying to sell the stuff at razor-thin margins. And so we're like, how, well, how do we protect ourselves? And we're like, you know what? I think we need to start our own brand mm. so that we can maybe institute some type of a map policy or an Amazon policy to protect our brand and yeah. uh, go from there. Yeah, and besides, you probably know the nuances and how to improve something, right? I mean, Correct. we know you, what sells. Yeah, yeah, like how you saw early on there was a need to improve just the buying of them, and mm-hmm. then you improve, you know, kind of made it, you know, brought in more fashionable stuff. So I don't know if you are allowed to say, but how would you improve for yours? How would you improve on what's already out there? Well, to be honest, to, to our initial. 
uh, offering would probably be emulations of, of components that we already know that sell or styles that we already know with our own variation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll probably sell everything will be offered in an anti-fog lens. Um, you see a lot of times that um, for cost purposes, the things uh, come in a, a non-treated lens or mm -hmm. whatnot. We're not, we're, we're not going to play that game. We're going to go right with anti-fog. Anti right. Uh, we'll probably offer some other types of uh, lens materials. Um, right now, polycarbonate is the lion's share of lens material for safety eyewear. Mm -hmm. um, Why is that? If it like shatters or something, does it hit your eye or something? Or no? Well, it doesn't shatter. It's, oh, it doesn't. It's, um, but it's cheap to produce. Mm. The optics are fairly well for polycarbonate. It's been popular forever for decades. Um, there's another <clears throat> material called CRT. Uh, that does just as well and there's another one that's called NXT which shares all the similar um, attributes of polycarbonate but it, the optics clarity is better mm -hmm. um, the, the impact resistance is better um, and so and then if you use any type of transition lens um, it transitions better than polycarbonate what are like, the challenges Mike, of, of doing your own. Obviously, there's a lot of benefits, right? You know, you don't have to compete. You know, you don't have to, it's not a race to the bottom. What are some of the challenges? I think challenges are brand awareness to begin with. You know, how do you promote your brand? Um, um, I think some other things too are, I guess, the crystal ball aspect of it, you know, is like, can you really predict if a style is going to sell? I mean, you can have all the indicators. It's like, it looks just like this other style that sells really well. How come ours isn't? Right. So, you know, you have that risk now of having maybe excess inventory in a particular style that doesn't sell, um, which means, you know, you have uh, you've wasted some investment dollars on that. Yeah. Do you have to house a lot of the um, products? We warehouse so? a lot of products. There are a handful of things that we drop ship. Yeah. Uh, but I would say 95% yeah. we warehouse ourselves. So how do you differentiate on other channels besides price? How do people differentiate? It's very difficult. Um, sometimes you can do it through, through clarity of information. Yeah. Um, which sometimes, I, and I'm sure you're familiar with this on Amazon, isn't always the easiest because it's almost like a chicken before the egg problem where you go to list something and somebody's beat you to the punch, but maybe they didn't list it very well or very accurately. And so you're like, ah, so now you're trying to stuck in that situation of trying to correct the errors and it takes forever. And But really on Amazon, the only way you can differentiate yourself is, is primarily price. Mm. At least that's what I've, I've found out. Yeah. Um, talk about the evolution of sales channels. So you start off, you have the Yahoo store. Yep. What was, what was the next evolution? We were actually in the Yahoo stores for an extremely long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things where, you know, you've been on a platform so, for so long, you just become embedded in it. And um, we started seeing it's more the painful to switch than yeah. not to switch. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because then all your backend systems are tied into it. So it's not just changing platforms. It's like changing everything you do. Yeah. All your procedures basically go out the window and rewrite them. Um, but it's the evolution of platforms started, I would say, probably 2014 mm -hmm. when we started seeing all the news about Yahoo and it's potentially going to be sold off. And, and, and uh, in fact, they did sell off the small business section. So in 2015, we started making plans to migrate, but we weren't sure where we wanted to go. Um, for the longest time, we thought maybe Shopify. Um, so what we did was we just opened up a couple of small test stores on different platforms mm -hmm. and started to play around with yeah. them and see yeah. which ones we liked. Which one did you test? We Shopify? Ended up selling, uh, Big Commerce. Enterprise. Big Commerce and Shopify? Yeah, Big Commerce is what we settled on. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Why? Uh, we liked the back back end was much easier than uh, Shopify for us um, in light years ahead of what Yahoo was offering. Um, it had a nice, it was the app selection. They had some built-in apps and an app uh, market. wasn't quite as robust as Shopify, 
But I think the one thing at the time that bothered me about Shopify was it seemed that it was very a la carte. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you want this function, get an app. If you want this function, this function, go get mm-hmm. another app. Big commerce, right. you felt, included more of those functions within the, the, yes. within the yep. platform. It was more of a complete turnkey for what we needed. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so Yahoo stores, then big commerce, now big commerce. And then when did you start branching into other um, kind of sales, sales channels, platforms? Uh, first, first quarter of 2017. Hmm. So this is pretty recent. It is. A lot of this, a lot has happened. And 2017 was kind of the year. It was like, okay, we need to start making decisions because we're falling behind. Hmm. So where else? So Amazon, where else can people find eBay? your stuff? eBay, okay. And uh, Walmart Marketplace. Mm-hmm. And was that a tough decision to do? It seems like Amazon is an obvious one because everyone's going in there. Was it tougher to the decision to do eBay and Walmart or no? Actually, eBay was our first decision. Oh, it was. Um, and uh, it's been very successful for us. We have a lot of success on eBay. And I actually really enjoy the platform. I think they've done a very good job. Um, Amazon was next, and then the Walmart's, Walmart Marketplace. Hmm. Um, and then software-wise, so you switched to BigCommerce. What mm-hmm. other software or apps do you use to run, run the business? Sure, our, our back-end systems, which is also our inventory and order management um, and CRM, is uh, Order Motion. Hmm. Okay. Uh, they're actually out of Manhattan, um, and we've been using them since 2004. Hmm. Um, and uh, they were recently purchased by Oracle. Wow. And um, so, which is nice because they've got some, I guess, more funds for development, so the... Um, They've really ramped up their development cycle, which is nice. Hmm. What else? What are some other integral pieces that you use? Sure. Uh, for the multi-channel listings, we use Channel Advisor, mm-hmm. and that helps us tie everything together. And then we used a small con- uh, consulting firm uh, to custom build an API that t- ties everything together. Nice. So from the products and the um, I guess the software and sales channel. Um, the I guess the next piece is uh, staffing. Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, it's you and your partner with a duffel yep. bag. And, yeah, it's just uh, and your us, wife. Two, yeah, just the two of us. And uh, we did that for about a year. Um, and then he had some, some family issues he had to deal with. And so I ended up buying his half out and uh, moved it to the garage. <laughs> And uh, we built a little office in our basement, and so we would process orders and answer the phones in the basement, and then I'd run upstairs and pack the orders and hurry off to second shift, and then come home, uh, do any little things I needed to do, and repeat that process. After about six more months of that, we were growing exponentially, and we're like, okay, uh, we can't do We were living in a subdivision at the time, and uh, it was frowned upon that UPS was showing up so often really you know, packages and delivered so we decided to buy a small home outside of the city limits that had a detached two-car garage uh, so we moved we bought that house I moved out there and um, hired our first employee what for and, and she yep she worked in the inventory yep, she did all the inventory and all the packing and then we decided, okay, uh, let's add on to the two-car garage. So we added an office onto the side of the garage. Mm. Hired like two new construction. More, yep, new construction. Mm. Yep. Hired two more employees uh, to help with the office, you know, taking orders and that type mm. of functionality. And then we ran into a situation where um, the UPS driver ran over one of the neighbor's dogs. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, the neighbor was associated with uh, the township board. So that created some red tape and some pressure mm. that we're, you know, probably shouldn't be running a business out of our home. And so, long story short, we, had, we bought our first commercial building in 2004. Wow. That's a big, big deal. It was a big gap. That was, a, you know, that was our first big loan. And, um, 
you know, it was pretty nervous. And I'm still working a second shift. And, you know, I'm still working a full-time job. At the time. At the time. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we buy this building. We move everything in there and get everything set up. And we have to buy furniture and all that type of stuff. And um, now we're getting to the point where, okay, I'm burning the candle at both ends and both ends here and I've been doing it for almost five years yeah I need to make a decision yeah. am I going to do this full-time or are we gonna maybe try to sell it or something of that nature because right. I just can't keep going it's a lot it's a lot I mean I, your second shift what are the hours second shift what is that from one to one uh, I think it was at 2 2 p.m. until either 11 or midnight and at the time I mean how much are you sleeping like two hours I mean I'm getting like maybe four hours a night, roughly. Wow. You know, wow. we have children, so we have babies to take care of, and that's and, crazy. Yeah, yeah. I was, and it was it was uh, it was getting very stressful. So after a long discussion, I just with my wife, I decided to take a leave of absence from the factory, and they allowed me to take a three month leave of absence. Mm. I came back, no problem. I could I could continue right where I left off. What did you tell them? Do you just tell them I have my own business? I'm going to go I at did. it, or and they knew they knew about it because yeah. they saw how popular popular it was at the factory and everything, and they knew yeah. something was happening. Yeah. Something it was popular. nice they let you do that, like bring it in was. the the stuff and sell to the staff and everything. It was yeah. it was something that I was you know I was very grateful and uh, they really treated me very nice there. It was a great place to work, honestly. And then one another reason why it was such a hard decision, you know, you're losing your medical benefits and at the time, a very stable and good-paying job. Yeah. So it was, and you probably have a lot of friends there too. A lot of friends, and you know how it is. You get a lot of advice, whether it's advice you want or maybe advice you don't want. And so, it, it's very difficult to weigh the pros and cons. Uh, but again, we decided let's do it. Three months leave of absence, and uh, once that started, I never looked back. Yeah. Once I was able to devote. 100% of my time to running the company, things really improved dramatically, and again, growth was exponential, and yeah. uh, it's probably the best decision that I made ever. <laughs> when you decided to go full-time in that amount of time, where did you focus your energy where you couldn't before? Uh, more energy in building the content of the site, you know, mm -hmm. better photography. That was something that even in 2004, 2005, imagery for the products was almost non-existent it's like you'd have a salesman show up at the door hey here's the new products well if you wanted pictures you got to take them yourself because the vendors just weren't offering them right or if they were offered they were such poor quality that they just didn't really condone themselves to online sales mm -hmm. so just pouring myself into producing the content uh, rewriting or even inventing the uh, product descriptions um, so that's where in 2006, my next acquisition was to hire a graphic artist um, and actually was a friend of mine that I used to work at at one of the factory jobs that I had. And he was kind of a Photoshop guru. Hmm. And um, uh, that really helped a lot right there with everything. So a lot of the staff, is it um, they have to spend time packing orders and, and doing kind of the warehousing stuff? Yeah, currently it's... Uh, we have CSRs up front that field all uh, all the customer service requests. We have one person who's responsible for um, uh, payables um, and receivables. We have an office manager. Um, I have IT manager now that handles not only online security but also building security. Um, I have a sales manager who basically manages all the product data and price changing and GSA uh, accounts. We have the graphic artist. We have a warehouse manager and purchasing manager who's responsible for maintaining the warehouse and, and um, reordering all the product. And then we have three shipping lanes. So we have three people uh, for shipping and receiving. And we have a person for uh, managing. We have a small store in the warehouse for our mm. local customers. Nice. Takes care of that. So I'm like, what's the what was the toughest hire? But you you look back and it was your best hire. Meaning, maybe it was hard for you to let go of something. Like I can do this, but it proved to just shoot the company up because you could spend your time on other things. I would say the hardest one was the warehouse manager. Mm -hmm. uh, 
slash purchasing manager. It's kind of a multi-hat job. Mm-hmm. Um, I It was so difficult to let go of ordering product and reordering mm. because you're spending money, right? And so Yeah, so what process did you put in place? Because you could see it and you're like, okay, you, you also have a, it's maybe, I mean, it sounds like Obviously, you're in the Marines. You can probably you probably have a ton of systems for things, but it's also a little bit of a feel, probably, where you're mm-hmm. like, I kind of it feel was like there's going to be feel. more of a more of sales in this month and this product. So, right. how, how did you train them? It was it was really difficult. And to be perfectly honest with you, um, at that time frame, we're talking 2006 now, 2006 2007 time frame. Uh, we were still operating a little helter skelter. Uh, we really didn't have a good set of written procedures down yet. Uh, we were still kind of flying by the seat of our pants. Um, and like, you know, when you, when it's your company, you live it and breathe it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything that's going on, you, you're basically have your finger on the pulse and it's so difficult to when you hire a person to take over that particular aspect of the job, are they going to care as much as you care and will they have the insights that you have? And so right. you try to communicate it to them, but it's different, you know, it's, it's, it's when it's something that you own and you've built, mm-hmm. uh, your feeling for something is just so much stronger than theirs. Well, at least you think it is. And I, I come to find out that all my worries were unjustified. I really? mean, this person did a fantastic job. Um, a far better job that I could uh, I could have done. Um, you know, they came from a, another business, so they had experience in inventory management, where I didn't. So they were able to put in place uh, procedures that I never considered. Yeah. So then, what can you start doing? That it sounded like that was a real that was freeing for you. You could you put someone in place that was good. You could spend yourself you know, your time doing other stuff. What do you right. then do? From that from that point, it's communicating. Catch up on sleep because you yeah, sleep you four hours a night start, for, start for ten years. With the children at home. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you know. I think a lot of it is just okay. I don't have to do that anymore. So let's talk to vendors. Let's ramp up brand, more brands. Bring in more brands. Um, now we're talking about two thousand eight. We've we're busting at the seams. We've outgrown the building that I said we'd never outgrow. Mm. Uh, we are in a four thousand eight hundred square foot building. I believe it was 800 square feet of office and 4,000 square feet of warehouse. We're busting at the seams. We've got no place to put anybody or anything. So we're like, okay, what are we going to do now? And so there's a small industrial park just south of town. And so we go over there on a whim and we go drive over there to see if anything's available. And lo and behold, there's a, a building that's 15,000 square feet, and the company just consolidated to Ohio, and they're going to sell this building. Mm. Right? This would be perfect. What was it before? It was a facility that resharpened industrial cutting tools. Mm. And so you can imagine resharpening industrial uh, cutting tools, it was just filthy and grimy. There was like cutting oil over spray right. everywhere. Like, and yeah, like the dust the, of metals dust, and exactly. other things. It was just yeah. horrendous. It's like, wow, what a bunch of cleanup this would take. And ultimately, uh, push come to shove, the price was right. So we decided to purchase the building. Yeah. So 2008, we move into this new building, clean it all up. I think we spent something like fifty thousand dollars wow. just to clean up the building. We had to grind the concrete floors, Jeez. repaint the entire building, tear out all the electrical infrastructure. Big um, project. But we, yeah, we finally get it done. We're all moved in, and again, it was probably the second best move we've ever did because you know we're still in that facility today, mm. and it's worked out beautiful for us. Um, and then we're leasing the previous building that we're in. So now we've got an additional rep. Yeah, it worked out. It worked out great. The only problem was we're talking 2008 and now the housing market crashes. Right. Um, which when the market crash didn't affect us immediately, it, it really hit us about a year after. Mm. Why? Um, that's when 
you know, the housing market just literally nobody was building houses. Hmm. And then you have all the subsequent industries like contractors that, that didn't need the safety glasses. We don't we don't have any employees anymore. We don't need to hire, mm. to hire anybody. And so the safety market kind of crashed a year after. Mm. And, uh, so those are probably a rough two years after that. It was really difficult uh, trying to scrounge up orders. And it wasn't just us. It was everybody in that in that category. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of where the fashion side helped us because of the profitability in the fashion market kind of helped offset some of it, not mm -hmm. all of it, some of it. So yeah, what niche has most surprised you? Meaning, like you got an order from I don't know some strange business you didn't know existed, but they need mm -hmm. maybe it's safety glasses, protective glasses, maybe not. Probably two. The two that surprised me the most are the people that like the vintage eyewear. So think of like the old plastic Buddy Holly type glasses with side shields. Mm. I'm still surprised at this day how many people like those. Mm. And it's not like just old guys. It's, you know, I think some of it has to come from maybe like the hip, the hipster culture and that type of thing. Um, so that's one niche that uh, surprised me. And I, I think the second one is laser protective eyewear. Um, I didn't realize how many institutions, labs, uh, universities use laser safety eyewear. Hmm. And uh, we're teamed up with a company out of Lyons, Michigan, that, that actually produces them. Hmm. And uh, it, it drives a significant volume. Hmm. Have you seen anything of late with computers? You know, yes. And I, I don't know. I mean, I have conspiracy theories about the radiation from computers that are affecting sure. us, but you probably know more actually have data to back it up but should people be people be wearing protective eyewear when they're sitting in a computer all day most people are um, and if so what what is best i think the danger and of course they should buy it on safetyglassesusa.com sure. but uh <laughs> well just keep in mind as a disclaimer i'm not a physician so <laughs> and um, you don't play one on TV, yeah. nor did you stay in a Holiday Inn. Got it. Correct. All disclaimers, yeah. yes. Yeah. And none of those qualify me. But um, uh, the one thing that your monitor does produce is blue light. And blue light has been known to cause um, uh, irregular, irregularities with your sleeping patterns mm. uh, because you're tricking your brain into thinking it's still daylight. Mm. Um, so we have seen... Uh, people who maybe suffer from uh, blue light induced insomnia uh, have seen benefits from wearing eyewear that blocks blue light, which is traditionally like, say, some of the styles that you see out there with computer gaming eyewear. They have like a yellow ish tent, tint to them. Yeah. Uh, and that's primarily for blocking blue light. I see that like on, on the, in your webpage um, under the shooting. The guy's wearing some kind of glasses with the shooting. What is that? Mm -hmm. It looks like an orange tint to it. Is that something different? It's similar. Um, you'll notice that like in shooting eyewear, people wear a yellow lens or an orange lens, and a lot of that is to increase contrast and improve your depth perception. Mm. And some of that comes from filtering specific wavelengths of light, and blue light is one of those that um, uh, blue light can cause a distortion in your vision. and during daylight hours you're just you don't realize how much blue light you're actually being exposed to it's it's quite a bit mm -hmm. and by reducing it you can really enhance your clarity it makes a significant difference so which glass is like on your site what category would people go to if they want to block that that blue light like if they, have if they just wanted something for their like there's they don't just for the computer sure we actually have a section under safety glasses called computer safety glasses huh. or computer glasses and uh, there's a couple of brands in there that are specifically designed for computer wear. Got it. Cool. Um, you know, throughout this journey, Mike, you have to make a lot of big decisions. Mm -hmm. Who are who's a mentor or someone who do you turn to for advice uh, when you you have to go through these? Sure. Uh, early on, um, I was lucky enough to stumble upon um, Joe Palco. Yeah, uh, that's how we met. Like, yeah, he was yeah. one of the founders of uh, Solid Cactus, yeah. and I think believe I believe before that it was Y Store Builders, I believe, which eventually evolved into uh, Solid Cactus, which was a Yahoo Store developer. 
Um, Joe and I, right off the beginning, we, we pretty much hit it off, and um, they were running already running a very successful e-commerce business called the Ferret Store. Um, so he had some experience, and he was, you know, he shared a lot of the do's and don'ts. Hmm. What did um, what what's some of the best advice he gave you that you remember? Hmm. Write your own product descriptions. Hmm. Um, is as painful as that as can be. That's it's extremely important. Um, and he's also the person that uh, told me about uh, Google AdWords before it was Google AdWords. I think it was at the time it was called Overture, I mm-hmm. believe, mm-hmm. which was either bought by Google or evolved into Google AdWords. And so we were buying uh, AdWords before it was AdWords. And uh, over time, Joe also helped me with SEO, educate myself in SEO, or pointing me in the direction of SEO experts and articles and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. What are some of the don'ts? Even from you, from your standpoint, too. Things to that don't you've, do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That you found that this, you thought it would work, maybe it just didn't at all, or, yeah. Uh, I think my biggest thing is don't be a copycat. Um, it's very, anybody can go online and copy and paste. Um, that's not going to get you anywhere. You have to create content that makes you stand out from the crowd, mm-hmm. um, which is not easy. It's difficult. You know, you're a content creator. You know how hard it is to create unique content. And um, I think that's the thing is don't copy and paste because it's not going to get you anywhere. You think it is, but it does nothing for you. Yeah. I mean, you were brought on by IRCE to talk about this topic, about right. content. Um, what's your process for creating good content for uh, your site? I don't have my my notes right in front of me, but I'll try to I'll try to wing it. Um, basically, I use a couple of different SEO and keyword tools to mm-hmm. go out there and kind of find things that are trending. Yeah, I really like to find. To me, more important than keywords are like uh, question phrases. So what are popular questions hmm. that people are posing about any particular keyword? So an example, um, I could type in uh, safety glasses and I'll show me all the questions that people have asked about that. Mm-hmm. I try to structure my content around answering those questions hmm. as in-depth as possible. Yeah. No wonder they just speak. It's genius. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it, 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 some some markets it doesn't work for, but for our market, I don't does. see what market it wouldn't work for. I mean, that's a good point. There, someone's always going to have questions when they're buying something. Maybe mm-hmm. some are going to be simpler than others, you know, mm-hmm. or, or you know, maybe a, some kind of electronic, maybe more complicated than sure. something that is, I don't know, uh, like a T-shirt or something. Right. Uh, but definitely, people always have questions. You know, whether it's a size or color. Um, and so do you have a set amount of time that you spend each day or week doing this or do you just kind of, here's what I want the flow to look like and you kind of tell the team, this is, this is what I want you to follow. So we work with a, um, an outside writer who actually lives here in three of us. And this was another thing that was very difficult for me to let go of. Um, we sit down, uh, four times a year and plan out quarterly, um, topics. Mm. And then, uh, from there we just, we kind of prioritize on the different topics. And sometimes it's maybe not creating something from scratch. Maybe it's refreshing a current topic, uh, you know, as things evolve. Um, uh, she'll go ahead and write out the lion's share of, of the article. Uh, our graphic artists will add, any type of imagery or, or video, and then I'll edit the content and do the final editing yeah. version. I love hearing this because I think maybe some of people's perception is just get a product and slap it up online mm-hmm. and start selling it, but there's definitely a methodology behind everything you're doing. You know, you have to, and you have to be consistent. Um, like I said, anybody can copy and paste, and so if you're just going to copy the vendor's descriptions, the vendor's images, and throw it online. Uh, there's a thousand other people doing the same thing. And so you have to find a way to differentiate yourself. Mm-hmm. And so on the mentor topic, 
Sure. Mike, I'm sure a big influence was the Marines. Mm-hmm. Um, what were some big lessons you took from, from the Marines? And if you have any crazy stories that you're allowed to share. Yeah. Um, I think probably the biggest lesson was, is don't quit. Hmm. Um, you know, as much as we talk about the success of running an e-commerce business for 17 years, that doesn't mean we didn't have hurdles or downtime mm-hmm. or moments when we thought, okay, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Um, and I definitely received my fair share of criticism uh, like whether what? It be from family members or friends saying this is never going to work. Who's going to buy safety glasses online? That's stupid. You know, that type of thing that right. you get when you try to do something of this, of this nature. Yeah. And so I think the biggest thing I take from the Marine Corps is you uh, don't quit. Don't give up. Just keep moving forward. What, what, how does that, what did that look like in the Marine Corps for you? Was like a specific like a uh, routine of a run or a workout what what do you remember that you it's that? just that it's just that that mentality that's at the time you know I went into into boot camp in 1991 was just after um, the first Iraq war and it was just drilled into you that you never give up no matter how bad you're hurting or what the situation is you just don't mm-hmm. quit you just keep mm-hmm. moving Forward until either you succeed or you die. I mean, point blank. Right. And it just kind of carried over to me. I, I, I guess I just had that mentality that I don't care how bad the circumstances are, I'm going to keep trying. And ultimately, it, it paid off. What made you decide to join the Marines? Uh, well, um, both of my grandfather, father served in World War II in the Army. Um, I had a few cousins and nephew or nieces that served in the Navy. My dad was uh, uh, spent a career in the Air Force, uh, so I've been surrounded by military members all my life. Um, I decided to join the Marine Corps because there's when I was in high school, I was approached by a Marine Corps recruiter, and there's just something about that branch that just really struck a chord with me. Um, I like how they you know, the, the, the honor that they held and, and the traditions and so forth. And so that really appealed to me. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I joined. Yeah. It looked like you were sort of like an engineer. You were putting together different parts. What did you do? I actually was a mechanic. A mechanic, uh, okay. So I was a diesel mechanic. I went to diesel uh, school. I was a 3522 was my MOS. Um, so day-to-day activities were, uh, repairing Humvees, five ton trucks. Um, I spent a year in Japan in, uh, um, Iwakuni, Japan, which was a Marine Corps air station. Um, when I showed up on my first day there, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. I, my first day there, they have these 5,000 gallon refueling tankers for the aircraft. And they had 15 of them, and two of them worked. And Wow. They're like, good luck. <laughs> yeah. And basically what happened is the guy who was responsible for working on those tankers had uh, was arrested because he was illegally selling motos- motorcycle parts. Mm. Um, he so had his own he, e-commerce business. Yeah. He was in the brig. And so they're like... Um, and the reason they selected me is because when I was in high school, I took two years of vocational automotive. And the engines that we, the small engines that we worked on were built by Oshkosh. And lo and behold, those 5,000 5, gallon tankers use Oshkosh engines for the pump motors. Mm. So, like, here you go, have fun. And so, over the course of six months, I, I was able to get all 15 of those tankers wow. running. That's amazing. It was a lot of work and a lot of overtime so to speak but it, it was very gratifying it was something i really enjoyed i i love being a mechanic and uh the the conditions and the way that unit was run was was uh, fantastic the really cool thing is is the people who worked on the flight line the marines were so happy that they actually had working tankers and and they were in good repair that they would often invite me out to the flight line and allow me to help refuel different types of aircraft. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was able to experience refueling F-18s, 
uh, different types of helicopters, and I just had a blast. It was very cool. Your beloved. Uh, uh, what was, would you say, a most memorable uh, story or moment in when you're in the Marines? Um, well, there's a couple. Uh, again, this is when I'm stationed at Iwo Kuni. Um, I, uh, I suffered an injury while working on a reta- uh, refueling tanker. Uh, we had to replace a, a hose reel. Every tanker has two retractable hoses, and they're different diameters. And the, the spring for this re- retractor was broken, so we had to replace it. Hmm. So if you can imagine under the belly of a tanker, it looks like a semi-truck, like a big milk truck tanker. There is a big metal cage, and inside those metal cages are where the hose reels reside. Um, and then it has a spring-loaded metal door that you lift up to access uh, everything. I'm already getting scared. I'm under yeah. a huge truck, and there's yeah, something that's so spring-loaded. Okay. It takes two guys to get this hose reel out of here because it's so heavy. Wow. And so you know you're breaking these bolts loose, and then you're you're rocking it back and forth to kind of unseat it so you can lift up and out of there. Well, we weren't paying very good attention, and we didn't realize that this spring-loaded door, three of the four springs were broken. So it only had one spring Jeez. keeping it up. And this door weighs probably, I'm estimating 180 pounds probably. It's like a, a metal mesh door yeah. made out of pretty heavy-duty metal. Right. Well, anyway, as we're rocking this hose reel back and forth, the door falls, and the edge of it hits me right on the top oh, of the gosh. head and splits my head open. Oh, <laughs> horrible. Yeah, and so uh, I end up getting rushed to uh, to medical, and a long story short, uh, my nickname for the, my rest of my tour there was Zipperhead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we could laugh about it in your life yeah. to talk about it. Um, that is crazy. I want you to talk uh, a minute about EDC Planet. Sure. What is it's EDC Planet? And, EDC. Yeah, mm-hmm. For people that don't EDC. know. Yeah, EDC Planet is a hobby, um, and it stands for everyday carry, which means the things that you carry on you at, uh, every day. Uh, the, the items you feel are essential that you must have with you at all times, and it differs from person to person. And so it, it's a it's a forum where you can go and share imagery or discuss those things that you carry with you on a daily basis. So is this like uh, weapons or what? Like what oh, it could be. You know, some people feel like I got to have a certain type of pen. I've got to have hmm. you know a field note notebook to write down my ideas or my lists it could be a pocket knife Hmm. Uh, what made you start that just an interest in that um it actually there was a uh back when uh, tumblr was super popular um i was active on tumblr and there was a, a, a college student who uh, would share different types of imagery from people who would we call them pocket dumps where you take everything out of your pockets and you put it on the table and arrange it and then take a picture of it and share it and this is what everything is and where you can find it and he did a very good job with that and I'm like you know what it'd be kind of fun to have a forum like that and so mm-hmm. as a hobby I built EDC Planet as a forum kind of a almost like a self indulgence so to speak mm. when I first read that I thought it was more for like prote- I picture people kind of protecting themselves with there's like a knife or gun, but it's not that at all. It could just be anything. It could be anything. Now yeah. there are sections for people who um, carry weapons, um, but it's it's that's not the sole purpose of it. No. Hmm. So, my first of all, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been awesome. I, I love hearing the the journey story, and uh, really, it's cool to hear the, sort of the evolution of the e-commerce journey from from two thousand. Um, I wanted to ask two final questions uh, since it's inspired insider. Um, and one is the low lowest moment, something that you had to really push. You talk about, you know, never quit moment. Mm -hmm. What was a low moment? And then the flip side, what's been a proud moment, uh, that you've had with the business? I think the low moment was after the housing crash, because there was a time there when, we weren't quite sure if we were going to make it. 
Um, we had that we were forced to lay off a few employees. Um, we really had to tighten our belt, so to speak, um, really get a handle on expenses. And, uh, so that was probably a low moment just because there was so much worry and anxiety going on. Um, it's amazing how after eight years that can happen so quickly. Yeah. It is, and it was in a blink of an eye, and it was, uh, you know, you're calling people that you trust in the industry, and they're having the same problem, and you're calling on customers who have been great customers for a long time, and they're like, you're getting a busy signal because they've closed their doors, and it was just, just wow. a very sinking feeling of not knowing what's next. Um we were able to, to get through that, I think probably for a high moment, uh, knowing that I became fully self-employed. I think that was a, a high moment, knowing that uh, I was no longer working for the man, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other proud moments that you've had? Oh, plenty along the way. You know, we've had milestones here and there. Uh, we have a GSA schedule, you know, being able to get through all the red tape and have a GSA schedule so that we can sell uh, specific products to the government was mm. a, a big milestone. Uh, a couple of brands, um, you know, uh, getting authorized to sell Oakley and Oakley SI products was a big milestone. Is that for hard? Us. Is that the, a lot of uh, people can fighting? Be very difficult, yeah, because yeah. they, they don't just accept anybody. Um, so. Yeah. I think another thing that we're very proud about is the number of uh, positive reviews we have from customers. Um, that, to me, that speaks volumes. And I still, to this day, get a summary of all the reviews that happen in the day, and I go through every single one of yeah. them. It seemed like even early on for you, Mike, that you stress customer service. Probably, um, you know, not everyone who started the Yahoo store was they were just trying to figure out the Yahoo store. They weren't probably bothering with the live chat function. That seemed that it was kind of part of your value. Now, how do you train the customer service staff to, you know, like you said, the, the people coming back and the customer service is huge? Well, the one thing that we, we free, the mantra that we pretty much live by is, you know, we got to take care of the customer, somebody else will. Um, in this day and age, it's awfully easy for somebody to go just somewhere else because really another vendor is only a mouse click away. Um, so we really work hard at training our CSRs in product knowledge. We have training every Thursday for an hour on new products, and we also do reminder training on existing products um, and technology. And then we have really ironed out specific procedures now so that the customer service experience is consistent. You know, it's like, hey, if I call uh, customer service uh, rep number one, I'm going to get the same message if I call CSR number three. So right. consistency is important to us. And, you know, push come to shove, uh, we'll eat an order if we have to. You know, if we feel like, hey, yeah. you know, this customer didn't do anything wrong. We'll, we'll take care of them in any way that we can. Yeah. Mike, um, I think everyone, thank you again. I think everyone should check out safetyglassesusa.com. Where else should we point people towards, or is that the best place? That's probably the best place if you're interested in, in, in that type of thing. I'm also available on Twitter. Um, I think my handle is uh, the Mike E73. Okay. Um, and then where, what about, um, I know you have a lot of information. Where can they find the, some of the, the information on, uh, you know, the content that you do? All right, sure. Uh, we have a blog. It's mm -hmm. blog.safetyglassesusa.com. Cool. So everyone check out safetyglassesusa.com or blog.safetyglassesusa.com. Right. And Mike, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Right now.